Good afternoon and good evening to all of the uh, people around the world. Uh, I'm your co-host with uh, Sally for today's Stanford Global Energy Dialogue. Today we have two leading experts to join us from the energy industry, Asha Balani and Bruce Niemeyer. Asha Balani is the Executive Vice President of Shlombajay Neo Energy, a position he assumed in February 2020. Ashok is responsible for the deployment of differentiated technologies and practices to decarbonize exploration and production operations and the development of new avenues of growth and emerging markets with carbon neutral technologies and Sri Lombardy. Asha Balani studied electrical engineering in India, holds a graduate degree in petroleum engineering from Stanford University. Bruce Niemeyer is corporate vice president of strategy and sustainability for Chevron Corporation, a role he assumed in 2018 Bruce Nimai is responsible for guiding development of Chevron's key strategics, including capital allocation, sustainability efforts, where focused efforts include, included investment and low carbon technology to enable commercial solutions and large scale carbon capture and storage operation. He earned a uh, bachelor degree in petroleum engineering from Colorado School of Mines is a registered petroleum engineer in the state of California. With this introduction to uh, Ashok and Blues, let me transition this to Sally. Okay, thank you very much, E, and, uh, and the whole team here. Uh, like usual, we'll start out with a quiz. So the question is, how many commercial scale carbon capture and storage projects exist today? None? Six, 26, or 121. Okay, so let's see how you did. Okay, wow. Okay, so it's um, pretty evenly split between zero, six, 26, and uh, 121. Uh, the single largest number was six. So actually, that's not true. Um, uh, today, according to the Global Cap Carbon Capture and Storage Institute, there are 26 projects that are in commercial operation today that have the capacity to capture and store 40 million tons of CO2 per year. Now let's move on to the next question, the next quiz. So what is the estimated need for CO2 capture and storage utilization um, in order to be able to limit warming to 1.5 to 2 degrees C uh, by 2050. Do we need 100 million metric tons per year, a billion metric tons per year, 5 billion metric tons per year, or 50 gigatons? And just to be clear, a gigaton is a billion tons. Okay, so go ahead and put in your answers. Oh, well, that's pretty good, actually, that um, the, the single largest answer was 5 um, billion metric tons per year. So, uh, so these numbers come from the um, IPCC fifth assessment report, uh, began to make the case that we were actually going to be able to need to extract carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And more recently, with the IPCC uh, report on limiting warming, uh, to uh, 1.5 degrees C, uh, also concluded and actually quantified the need, and it's somewhere between 5 to 10 billion tons per year um, by the time frame of 2050. So you can see right away that, you know, given we're at 40 million tons uh, per year today and we need to scale up to 5 to, uh, to 10 uh, billion tons per year, you know, we're talking about 100-fold uh, scale up. So uh, quite uh, quite a challenge. Okay, so let's uh, let's go ahead and start our conversation. Uh, so welcome, uh, Ashok and Bruce, and uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, uh, in March of this year, it came to our attention that you had announced an exciting new carbon capture and storage project in California. And we'd like to begin today's discussion uh, by learning more about this. 
So Bruce, why don't we start with you? Uh, so specifically, Chevron, Schlumberger, and Microsoft, uh, together with a company called Clean Energy Systems, uh, announced that you would be investing in a first-of-a-kind carbon capture and storage project in California, in a small town called Mondota. And the, the project will actually take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, uh, produce electricity at the same time, creating so-called negative emissions. Uh, so could you explain this project to us? Uh, you sure, Sally, and it's a pleasure to be uh, with everybody uh, today. Uh, so what the project does, Mendota is in the Central Valley of California. That's a important agricultural area for the country and the state. There are uh, almond trees and, and other um, you know, material that's grown as part of the agricultural process. Typically at the end of their useful life, those trees are uh, disposed of through burning and uh, that uh, the carbon that they capture across their life is released back into the atmosphere. Um, what's novel about this project is it will take those trees that need uh, to be disposed of in some way and it will become the feedstock for a facility in Mendota um, that um, by utilizing new technology will uh, take that feedstock generate electricity for sale back to the grid in California and the carbon will be captured and that carbon initially captured by those almond trees will be permanently sequestered uh, underground and um, an associated uh, sequestration aspect. So um, all in it uh, provides electricity that's you know um, needed by the state and it's a negative carbon at the same time and that that um, makes it a very exciting project and, and we think it takes you know, the complementary capabilities of the four companies coming together to do something like that. Okay, great. Then, well, thank you. So, so Ashok, you know, why was this uh, project attractive to Schlumberger and how do you see this fitting into your long-term plans? Okay, good morning, Sally and Yi. Thank you for inviting us to this talk. Um, always good to be with Stanford, even, even if it's virtual. Um, hopefully we'll do this face-to-face -face in a short period of time. So this project, uh, we, we actually started from Shlambaji working with uh, uh, clean energy systems uh, about uh, two years ago. Uh, and um, at the same time, as the, the world was kind of reviving a lot of interest in carbon capture and sequestration after, let's say, a height of so a few years, there was a lot of interest in, say, the 2004-2012 timeframe when lots of projects were done, experimental projects. But I think from a business or economic standpoint at that time, the world could not get their arms around uh, getting carbon sequestration going. So uh, with the new impetus of uh, uh, net zero climate change issues and uh, all the countries passing laws to go to net zero, uh, and understanding that uh, net zero by 2050 or 2060 would not be possible, even with all the advent of renewables and hydrogen and lithium economies, uh, it was clearly understood that uh, one way or another carbon capture and sequestration would have to come into a business configuration that can scale. And so we started also trying to see how we could have business configurations where this could be economically feasible. And uh, I, it so happens that California with its LCFS uh, fuel standards and with uh, 45Q from the federal government, there is a good chance of making something like this uh, economically feasible. So while we worked with governments or companies to do projects purely as uh, on contract, we wanted to have an innovative business configuration where we could make uh, something quite adventurous as a hugely negative carbon project uh, to be economically viable given the regulations that already exist. So uh, the fact that these uh, uh, three very large companies and uh, um, uh, a small company which is uh, technically quite innovative come together in this configuration is an attempt at making these kind of business models or business configurations um, uh, pursue these interests, which will make um, projects like this uh, scalable in the future. So we are very interested because it is, let's say, a game-changing approach to making something 
uh, from a business standpoint, viable for the future. Okay, well, terrific. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ashok. Uh, yeah, Schlumberger has been uh, very involved in, uh, in a lot of the technical aspects of uh, carbon capture and storage really from the, the very beginning. Um, so Bruce, so, so what was it about this project, uh, and I guess about this time, uh, that made you decide to invest in this? When, why is this important to Chevron? Well, we think carbon capture is important to the future. We think the future of energy is lower carbon. As one of your uh, poll questions you know, alluded to, the IPCC also sees the importance of carbon capture. We think it's, it plays an essential role, um, but we have to make progress as society. And uh, we thought that this represented a confluence of uh, events that this particular project was quite innovative and uh, we wanted to be a part of it. And you know, we have... Um, uh, you know, some constructive policy in California. Uh, we have the right, um, you know, circumstances around this project. And, and we see a role for Chevron to invest in low carbon technologies that can commercialize. And if we're going to scale uh, CCUS to the five to 10 uh, gigaton range, it's going to have to be commercial um, in order to attract the, the level of attention around the world to deploy it at that sort of scale. And we think uh, when we see those kinds of opportunities, um, that's a place and a role we can um, uh, play and, and be involved in. And this will be a, a first of uh, for uh, California. And uh, so we think it uh, be, can be a, a gateway project uh, for other opportunities in the state. Okay, terrific. Well, thank you. So, E, back over to you. Well, thank you, Sally. So it's uh, really good to learn uh, about Chevron, Schlumberger, and Microsoft team up to do this project in California. <clears throat> I want to ask a question, a shock to you. Uh, Schlumberger is known as a company to bring the most advanced technologies to, uh, to very challenging problems. Uh, so what are some of the technological challenges for CO2 capture and storage? And how can Schlumberger's technology help? So it's a technically interesting question from a technology standpoint uh, and uh, it, it, you know, when all that, all those series of experimental projects were done uh, 15 or so years ago, uh, something that did come out of all of that effort was a lot of advance in uh, technologies related to the subsurface. And so where we use things uh, and pertinent to Stanford in particular, where we uh, use uh, uh, reservoir simulation for understanding how oil and gas uh, and water move in porous media, we came up with the simulators, for instance, that would analyze <clears throat> how CO2 could be, would move in a saline aquifer. But the understanding of CO2 in an oil reservoir ha was, uh, was there before, but CO2 in a saline aquifer all came about because of all those projects that were done. And today we have the right kind of simulators or models by which you can understand if you do pump CO2 in a saline aquifer, where does it go and how does it behave and so on, which gives you an idea of the, the assurance that it will stay in the right place for a very, very long period of time. Similarly, the well engineering technologies, the technologies for assuring that you have the right kind of uh, integrity for the system to be able to do this kind of storage. It all came say 15, 20, 10, year, uh, 10 years ago. And uh, it went into the classification schemes that the DOE and EPA worked on. And today the idea of class six permit exists, which is all part of the technical regulatory framework that can make these technologies feasible in a practical world, if you want. So from a sequestration standpoint, I think uh, the world's knowledge of what happens when you put CO2 in the subsurface is fairly advanced, I would say. Of course, as we do more practice commercially, we will learn a whole lot more. Now on the capture side, which is a bigger challenge there, I would just divide the issue in three sort of categories. There is the category of uh, 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 concentrated emissions where the emissions are easy to catch uh, or relatively uh, low cost to capture. And then there are dilute streams which are harder to capture like in a cementing or steel process or the direct air capture from the atmosphere. 
And today we are really trying to, to kickstart, if you like, the, from the 40 megatons that you said towards that, you know, almost at infinite, looks like at the horizon, the vision of uh, uh, five to 10 gigatons. Uh, at least we want to look at the concentrated streams and come up with the right commercial models, the right business models to actually make that happen so that we kickstart the whole business of uh, carbon capture and sequestration. And for that, I think by and large, the technologies exist to be able to capture these concentration, concentrated streams and put them in the ground. So the, 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 let's say the urgency of the moment is to get the business going, if you want. And that's what uh, Chevron and Chambergé are trying to do here, uh, coupled with the power of a company like Microsoft and with the technical innovative capability of clean energy systems. So uh, I think all of these put together uh, are going to make currently already available technologies, uh, make, make use those technologies to make uh, business with carbon capture and sequestration happens. Meanwhile, there is a bunch of companies looking at capture in diluted streams to bring the cost down to the $30, $40 per ton uh, range. And there's also a, a series of companies which are looking at direct air capture and there the costs are much higher, but over time as these technologies get proven in the lab and, and at smaller scale, then they will scale to uh, practical implementation. So, so there is, let's say a roadmap of currently available technologies. They need to go into new business systems or business practices that make carbon dioxide a business uh, sequestration of business, and then they will follow on from there on the roadmap towards the ambition of five to 10 gigatons. Yeah, well, it's very exciting to think about how do we do this scale up, right? This California project, 40 million ton by to 200 of those to become a eight gigaton scale. Um, so I'll show you know, uh, in Stanford and Prequel Institute, put my director head up and actually Sally is uh, doing this planning together with Alun and a few others on this carbon removal workshop. Uh, I think there's a lot of technology innovation we will be needing. So now let me turn to Bruce. Um, Chevron has been involved with other carbon capture and storage projects around the world. Uh, certainly most notably is the uh, uh, Gorgon project in Australia. Uh, what have you learned from this and other carbon capture and storage project that would help make the new project a success? What are the key lessons learned? Well, it's a good question. Um, you know, we're, we're uh, a company that, that solves uh, hard problems and we typically partner with others to do that. Um, well, I think one thing we've learned is that while there's a lot of attention on what's new or novel about a project, in this case, you know, the, how the carbon is captured, there are a lot of other things that are necessary in order to make it work. Um, you know, you have to, you know, contemplate um, how you move uh, fluids, how you uh, provide power, um, you know, logistics questions of how you move things in and out, things that are, are more mundane but are necessary in order to get projects done in, in, the, in the real world. Um, I think the other thing is to be, um, you know, uh, understanding about the facts that serial number one um, always has certain kinds of new challenges with it. And, you know, that's what we're engaged with. And it's why, you know, companies like Schlumberger and Microsoft and Chevron, you know, uh, working together are really positioned to, to tackle the particular challenges. But serial number one, you will have surprises. You will have things that you didn't expect and you will have to, you know, work to uh, work around those things. And um, as an industry, I, I've been in the industry now for 37 years, things we do today on a routine basis were unthinkable when I started. And it took um, pioneers, individuals that preceded me uh, to work those problems out, to figure out how you take concepts that you might first develop in a um, academic setting and convert it into uh, the considerations that are necessary to get it to work in the real world. And so, you know, in a place like uh, Gorgon, we've learned how to apply things um, in the real world, not only the capture of carbon, but the movement of the CO2 then uh, to injection wells, uh, to sequester it in the subsurface and to do the monitoring. 
um, you know, of what happens in, in the subsurface. So, um, you know, the moving from the conceptual um, to the real world, um, I think is probably, you know, where our learnings in particular will be helpful in this project. Okay, so, uh, so, so Asha, you know, the really the framing for this conversation is scaling new technologies. And, you know, over the past, um, you know, several decades, you know, we've seen solar and wind and, and now uh, batteries and, and EVs, you know, starting to scale. But if we think about carbon capture and storage, um, you know, what do you see as the critical challenges to, you know, achieve this 100 fold scale up over the next three decades or so? And, and just to create a little more context, you know, it, it involves like what kind of policies do you need? Uh, you know, what is the investor appetite for these projects? What's public opinion? Um, you know, how challenging is it to invest in infrastructure or to build infrastructure? Because, uh, you know, anything that you're doing with sort of on the ground presence, you know, there's all kinds of regulations and permitting. And yeah, so, so you know, looking at the, this roadmap um, that you laid out, you know, what do you see as the critical challenges and, 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 and how might, um, you know, how might governments or organizations help? So in a sort of a multi-choice question uh, with lots of answers, uh, there's always this one thing at the bottom which says all of the above and the answer in this case is all of the above probably. I, I think uh, as Bruce and I have both been saying, I think we, we, we found this project to be a good starter project that we, where we could create a very innovative uh, group of companies, uh, which by the way are, let's face it, Chevron and Schlumberger work together. That happens every single day, and, you know, is happening all over the world every minute, if you like. But uh, the fact that Microsoft is involved, the fact that there's an innovative company, which is uh, a partner in the, the, the whole scheme, this is new, you know, and what we are working on here is to try and put together uh, uh, stakeholders who all have uh, something to bring to this uh, very important uh, uh, exercise to to kickstart something you know it's not the, the the whole business is not just this project by itself this is only the beginning if you want right so uh, we've spent almost a year now working in 10 different streams where we have uh, talked to the regulators where we have talked to the uh, the farmers in Central Valley and understood whether the bio waste biomass, what kind of a problem it is, and is it advantageous for, for them. We've talked to the existing mothball plant, which was producing power 20 years ago, but now is mothballed and is going to be reutilized by doing something like this and create jobs in the Central Valley. So we've talked to uh, the technical people and done the experimentation to understand can we actually can we actually gasify and capture 100% of the carbon dioxide that will be produced to have a perfectly clean waste biomass disposal scheme? If you know. We've talked to the, the California Air Resource Board to understand whether it will qualify for the LCFS incentives and so on. So all of that work has been done to just to understand that this kind of a project can be feasible. And then we're going to go into a front end uh, engineering process now, design process, which will risk mitigate this process in the next year or so as well. You know. Now, all this to say that it is the process that companies such as this follow to risk mitigate these processes and make them, as Bruce said, commercially viable. You know, we, we do that for a living in oil and gas. We're going to do that here as well in this case, with the use of a lot of innovative pieces uh, of uh, technology and practice. You know. uh, now, this being said, still, this is only the, the first. And uh, we, in separately and in, with other people, are working in the, the steel industry right now, in the cementing industry right now, in the biofuels industry, and forming similar configurations to see whether we can bring the, the practice of uh, carbon capture and sequestration to all those industries where there are hard to abate problems down the road, but there's low hanging fruit in the uh, concentrated streams of carbon dioxide. 
Now, this is going to need help from everybody. It's going to need help from the regulators. It's going to need help from the public for public acceptance for something like this. It's going to need the help from academia for research to move things forward. It's going to need help from a lot of different. Uh, the, and I'm only talking right now about the United States. You know, so Europe has a slightly different way of uh, approaching the issue. So you have uh, hubs being formed in the North Sea by a consortium of companies working together with the Norwegian government or with the UK government or with the Netherlands government. And uh, these hubs will then uh, spawn off capture activity from various industries by various players. And there will be some kind of business practices established to be able to capture carbon and put it in the ground. You know. Now, all of this effort requires a lot of people to come together and a new kind of partnerships to form and to, to you know, leverage new business models for the future. An interesting aspect of carbon capture and sequestration is that there is no product that is being produced that you can sell to someone and make commercial money out of it. You are actually taking, let's say, a waste gas and putting it into the ground so no one actually buying a product, if you like, right? So it is a business that is difficult to establish from a business model standpoint. You know? And that's where a lot of the, the near-term challenge lies. Now, when there are uh, 100 projects like this working all over the world and the, the constituent companies or the shareholding companies or the stakeholders are realizing that this is feasible commercially, then yes, it will have a, a life of its own as scale, uh, very quickly after that. You know. I think technology will follow from for capture and for sequestration. Okay, terrific. Thank you. Thank you for that really thoughtful answer. Um, so, so Bruce, you know, looking, you know, beyond California, um, I mean, in some ways, California, you know, has created a very unique opportunity in that the low carbon fuel standard, you know, the value of those credits is what on the order of $200 a ton of CO2. And and uh, and the um, 45 Q tax credit is about $50 a ton. So, you know, the, the, it's kind of easy to see how that might be um, uh, attractive. Uh, also, um, there is biomass in, in the Central Valley, you know, as we heard about waste biomass. And and then it also turns out that the Mendota overlies a, a very good uh, saline aquifer for, for storage and so forth. So there were lots of things that, you know, make it, you know, very encouraging for it to be a success. So if we think though, you know, beyond California, um, you know, in the United States and, and more broadly around the world, you know, we need carbon capture and storage, not only here, but, you know, we need to think about China, we need to think about India, uh, of course, Europe. Um, and uh, so, so what do you see as the, the challenges and how do you sort of see that, that sort of rolling out over the next couple of decades to, to get to scale uh, everywhere? Well, Sally, you're right to observe. There's a lot of things that are, are in our favor uh, in, in Mendota, which is, you know, why we would start there first. But, but to scale, uh, you know, I would just point to two things and they're recurring themes and Ashok touched on them a bit. One is cost. Um, and the other is policy. And we really need uh, the advancement you know, advancement on both of those. Uh, technology um, and uh, you know, getting beyond serial number one uh, can help us with cost. Um, in the case of uh, Mendota, we have a particular set of conditions um, which the technology I think is well suited for. Uh, but as we think about scaling more broadly, we have to consider going to um, more dilute streams and how we capture those effectively. And um, you know, we have technology investments in a variety of places uh, to deal with that, all the way from you know, very concentrated streams to the most dilute stream, which is uh, direct air capture. And so you need, you need progress in that space with technology, um, not to prove that it can work because we can see that it works, but it, in order to commercialize it, it needs to be cost effective. And, and so that's the sort of progress we need on the one hand. On the other hand, um, we need you know, supportive policies. And where you see carbon capture projects evolving today, you can also see a supportive policy overlay with where those things are occurring. And um, it's um, a new area uh, you know, for society and policies 
have to evolve to uh, align with society's interest in this regard. So we're fortunate in California that uh, we have uh, supportive policies in the LCFS, the low carbon fuel standard, and in 45Q uh, nationally in the US and to um, expand in addition to the progress in technology, that evolution of policy is gonna be essential. Those are the two, those are the two particular uh, you know, supporting activities um, that are essential for our ability as a society to scale uh, carbon capture. Okay, thank you. Eve, back over to you. Yeah, thank you, Sally. Um, so the discussion clearly show uh, technology innovations. These are very important. Um, Ashok, I want to ask you, the Shalomba J is involved in uh, developing other technologies <clears throat> beyond your CO2 capture and, uh, um, and storage and so on. Um, particularly recently, uh, you, know, you are involved in uh, into lithium ion batteries such as lithium extraction. So what are the challenges right there for scale up? Um, how much does the in industry needs to grow? And what role does Shlombaje play growing this uh, industry? You know, just looking at the scale, right? Because I work in the lithium ion batteries areas. If I, I will look at, it, I say, well, this year, the, uh, let's say 2020, the production of lithium ion batteries is probably around a 400 gigawatt hour. Uh, what we really need, uh, we need uh, the early production probably go up by 10 to 100 folks, you know, in the next couple of decades. Uh, so I want to pick your thought on, on, on those questions. Yeah, I think you are right. We, we are working on um, uh, different avenues of uh, growth towards uh, decarbonization or say low carbon or no carbon technologies. And uh, in each one of those sectors, let's say, there needs to be a very large increase. Uh, so in the tens or hundred fold increase uh, in the coming decade, if we are going to go towards the good goals or the sustainable scenarios in the future. So in, uh, I, I think uh, <clears throat> we are, we're working in the, the domain of hydrogen the, and also in the domain of lithium and uh, particularly in lithium, over the coming decade, uh, there needs to be a massive increase because now I think it is pretty well understood that electric vehicles will become the order of the day on the road. Uh, and hence, uh, with this huge increase that will happen in electric vehicle uh, deployment, uh, there is going to be a surge of requirement for lithium. Um, and um, uh, without going into too much detail, uh, let's say a number which is like uh, 50 kilotons for uh, something like lithium hydroxide monohydrate, which is an important uh, compound for uh, the batteries that are going to be used in cars uh, with the right kind of energy density. The increase has to be from 50 to like a million tons uh, of uh, lithium hydroxide in the next uh, seven, eight, 10 years, you know. So, that's a large investment and is a, is a pretty big challenge. So we, we've been working on uh, how to extract lithium from brine, uh, brine which is found in the subsurface. So we obviously understand uh, how to uh, extract, uh, let's say lithium loaded brine from the subsurface and then to extract the lithium in a very efficient process. And then, uh, uh, end up with a very clean brine without the lithium, which we can pump back into the ground so that environmentally the whole process is sustainable. Uh, today, some of the processes that are used, or in fact, all of the processes that are used are not sustainable from this standpoint because they utilize a lot of the water and don't return the water into the ground. So uh, our, the, the new innovation that hopefully will come and scale in the near future will be a sustainable process that will um, uh, manage the water in the correct manner. Now, these, knowledge, these, these uh, kind of competencies, not particularly in the, the, the sector of lithium, but in, in general framework, we understand from uh, our businesses in the future, in the past. So we can apply some of that knowledge to have 
a continuous chemical process uh, which can return very safe water back into the ground and yet extract enough lithium for to make it commercially viable. And today the world knows how to extract lithium from uh, brines which have something like a thousand ppm and we will be able to move to brines which are like 100 ppm so we'll expand the target addressable market for uh, lithium brines that can yield good lithium for uh, battery the battery making industry which will allow all these gigafactories which are being planned in the united states and in uh, uh, asia and in uh, europe uh, to scale uh, better. Otherwise, there will be a surge of lithium demand, which the world would find it difficult to meet uh, in the next few years. So I'll just take that as a sector. One sector is very interesting. And uh, I think everybody relates to the fact that EVs are coming. But behind the fact that EVs are coming, a lot has to happen to enable the, the, the ramp up of uh, electric vehicles in the world. And this is just one of those issues where we are trying to create a new business. Yeah. So Ashok, this is very exciting. Um, you know, the whole world has about now uh, 1.4 billion uh, cars uh, running on the road. Uh, about 1 billion is a passenger car, 400 million close to that is car trucks, big, big buses, right? So if I look at this 1 billion passenger car all become electrical, uh, require assuming 50 kilowatt hour of a battery pack. This require 50 terawatt hour of lithium ion batteries. So with a 400 uh, gigawatt hour production right now, it, it takes a hundred years to produce uh, this much of lithium ion batteries. So that also means, you know, we need to shorten that to 20, 30 years time frame to get there and uh, lithium extraction production will likely increase by about five folds in the I think next decade also very exciting. Now let me look at that uh, about 400 million you know trucks and buses. This is really heavy you know uh, <laughs> heavy stuff. Uh, lithium ion battery might not be able to supply the power. Then there's a lot of discussion about hydrogen. Right. A lot of you, you touched upon early on a little bit, uh, you know, Schlumberger, New Energy and CEA and, and the partners you know, announced the, uh, this project uh, formation of uh, Genvia is for the uh, clean hydrogen production, uh, this kind of joint venture. Well, tell us about this joint venture and its uh, importance. Yeah. So you, before I go to hydrogen, I, I have, uh, just coming back to the batteries, uh, yeah. whatever, 400, 4 low, whatever. The, I think there are two very important aspects, and I think it's important for, for the, this audience to understand that while there is the aspect of growing lithium batteries very quickly, there is the aspect of making it more efficient. So uh, I think I'm, I'm going to uh, sort of return the the question to you people like yourself institute of uh, energy efficiency i think the work that you do in coming up with new materials and the work that you are going to do uh, coming up with new materials which are going to make batteries more efficient uh, in terms of energy density it's very very important if those batteries don't go up that roadmap then the the scaling cannot happen so there is the aspect that you cover uh, and the aspect that uh, extraction covers that have to go both together to make some of these things happen. While, by the way, it is a challenge, it's also a very exciting area because it is very, very interesting innovation for the future. So uh, it's, it's good that we work together on, on uh, these subjects. So similar to that, we did something on uh, hydrogen. We um, uh, created a company called Genvia in France. Uh, that company is, is a public-private partnership, actually, in that case. In all of these, the configurations are quite important. And the public-private partnership is between the Atomic Energy Agency in France called the CEOA, which has a technology arm called CEOA Tech. Uh, and they have um, some technology that they have been working on for the last 20 years uh, on uh, solid oxide high temperature electro electrolyzers. And we, in that case, are the industrialization or commercialization arm 
along with a few other stakeholders. And uh, there are three that are actually shareholders in Genvia. Uh, these three are a very innovative cement company, which is a hard to abate sector for emissions. There is a very innovative construction company, which runs all the auto routes in France and owns all the, the stops. Uh, and then there is a region of France as well, which wants to completely decarbonize and move to a hydrogen economy. So while between the CEO and Schlumberger, we bring the expertise of trying to industrialize this technology of solid oxide high temperature electrolysis, which is the most efficient way of uh, turning renewable energy to hydrogen, there are uh, parallel projects that are going to be launched by all these companies working together with us to create the systems, the hydrogen systems that are going to be utilized in the cementing process or in charging stations or in, uh, in uh, local buses and so on and so forth to actually create a movement on the whole value chain to create a new hydrogen economy for the future. So the company again has been put together uh, by all of these stakeholders. Of course, it will work with many other people all over the world as well, but at least it starts off with the right stakeholders that are going to come together and emphasize the whole value chain build up for green hydrogen in the future. That is our effort on hydrogen, the company called Genvia, which we just launched in January. Yeah, so hydrogen is so important actually in Prequel Institute, we are planning to launch a major initiative on clean hydrogen, so uh, I'll keep you updated. Bruce, now let's turn to you. Um, we touched upon a little bit on direct air capture. Of course, this is very important, but very, very challenging problem. Uh, require technology innovation. You know, er earlier, we have seen, we hosted the Bill Gates uh, uh, event right here in the Global Energy Dialogue, and uh, he mentioned direct air capture. And you have seen in the news, uh, Tesla's uh, co-founder, Elon Musk, um, giving a $100 million prize for direct air capture. Chevron, um, your company, has also invested in this uh, DAC technology. Can you explain this technology to us and why Chevron is interested in this? Well, direct air capture is, you know, the most, it's the shortest path to reducing CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, the challenge is one of physics though. It it's, takes a lot of energy to take a dilute stream or dilute CO2 as it exists in the atmosphere and concentrating it to the point that you can do something with it, whether you sequester it underground or you put it into a process to put it into some other beneficial reuse. We have an, another investment in a company that would take CO2 and turn it into a alternative aggregate for cement. So anywhere where you have cement, that could be a permanent storage of carbon, uh, but you gotta capture it first. And so that's the great, that's the great challenge. Uh, we invested in a company called Carbon Engineering. Uh, it is a direct air technology-based company. Um, and the process is you bring air in over very large fans and you use something to take the CO2 um, out of that air, concentrate it, and then give you the opportunity to do it. And uh, we know, you know, the physics work or, you know, the, the chemistry works. It's a question of how much energy do you have to put into it? What sort of cost is that? And if, you know, at high cost, it's a barrier to being able to scale it broadly. Um, but with many things, the first iteration, the first example is a high cost. Um, and, you know, you get on a trajectory of learning much as we've seen happen with wind and solar. Um, so uh, we have great interest in it. Uh, but if you look across the spectrum of where you would go to abate carbon, you would start at a place like Mendota because you have a confluence of supportive uh, factors, both technical uh, policy and other. Um, and you would work then towards less dilute streams or less dilute streams, ultimately getting uh, to direct air capture. But you can't do this all sequentially. Um, every time you look at the scale of the energy system, and you mentioned earlier, e, the car park, 1.4 billion cars, and what that consumes, that's a very large number. And that's a very significant thing to consider in terms of how do you evolve that and make that lower carbon, it doesn't happen overnight. 
So what we observe is you have to do all of the above. You know, you, as you try to look at the math of relying on any one approach, any one technology, the scale gets so big that the likelihood you can implement and accomplish society's objectives aligned with the Paris Agreement you know, seem more remote. But by an all of the above approach, um, we think it's much more likely. And so we have investments in a number of uh, aspects of lower carbon uh, future technologies, including direct air capture. And we started those today because we believe making progress today will be important for it to play a role in the future. But there's much that has to occur from present day uh, to make that uh, economic and give it the potential to scale. But, um, but we see great promise in it and that's why we're invested. Thank you, Bruce. Back to you, Sally. Okay, thank you, E. Um, so, so let's get back to the to the principal topic of today's conversation. That is like scaling CO two capture and storage. Uh, and just to provide a little context, you know, this is a technology that actually got its start, start in the nineteen seventies, uh, where we began pumping carbon dioxide back underground to enhance oil recovery. So the basic technology of drilling and CO2 injection, you know, really it was established then. Um, and then in the 1990s, uh, Statoil, uh, as a consequence of responding to government policy uh, that, that penalized uh, atmospheric emissions of CO2, uh, they began to do CO2 capture and storage with the specific purpose of, of, of mitigating climate change. And if we look since then, the technology has grown at a rate of about 9% a year. And if we have any hope of getting to 5 to 10 billion uh, metric tons per year, we need to you know, double, at least double that rate, rate of growth. And so you know, I think we're at a, a very special moment where uh, policymakers and the public and, and uh, you know, leading uh, thought organizations um, you know, are making the case that this is an important technology. And, and I'll just point to the IEA on, on, you know, Monday came out with its report on, you know, how we could hope to achieve a, a net zero by 2050. And they really highlighted the critical role that, that carbon capture and storage plays. So, uh, so now imagine in our audience, we've got, uh, you know, we've got influential policymakers and you, you know, make the case for what are the three most critical things that we need to be able to sustain the momentum that, that, uh, that you and others have begun today. And, and Bruce, why don't we start with you? Well, it, so, um, you know, thinking about uh, policymakers, I think having uh, supportive policies are important. Uh, in the LCFS program, as an example, you have to qualify pathways. You know, what activity are you doing and how does that contribute to the ultimate goals of the program? Um, and, and for other, you know, policies maybe that don't exist today, you know, thinking about what the opportunity is. Um, you know, the what we've observed in in policies in general, if they can operate at the highest possible level, if they can be technology agnostic, uh, and if they're aligned with what you know we're trying to accomplish as society, those those from a policy standpoint are uh, the, you know the very best. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of innovation in um, our in our companies in, in the economy overall in places like Stanford. And you need policies to unlock that innovation um, and uh, take you places that you might not have expected. So, you know, it, it may to put it in more direct terms, it's helpful for policy to help us establish the goal or the objective, um, but not tell uh, companies and organizations that might be engaged in this how to do it, uh, because the how to do it is often where um, the real innovation occurs and, and we get surprised in, in, in so many ways in that regard. So, uh, you know, you could probably fill one, two and three in policy, um, but there are some technology, you know, things that have to happen as well. There, you know, the a learning curve uh, that has to exist um, and it, it gets to, you know, a um, hundred, you know, detailed things in terms of well, which chemistry you're using. Are you using something that's solid? Do you have electricity and how you're trying to you know, separate uh, CO2 from uh, the atmosphere or whatever the stream is. There's, there's a number of, of, of things uh, in that regard, but, but most broadly, um, having a line policy, um, very important to be supportive and not, you know, stymie um, innovation. And I, I think 
um, that's probably the place that I would start. Um, well, I mean, I, I think Bruce uh, covered the, the subject quite well. And I, I, it's very difficult to sort of say that at this high level, these are the three most important things. Uh, but there is devil in the detail a little bit, you know. So, uh, for instance, I'll pick up just one or two detailed points related to that a certain thing needs to happen, need to happen. Uh, but then there is, you know, for, for instance, one, one issue on just CO carbon capture and sequestration is that I think the process for uh, class six permitting, which allows you to pump carbon dioxide into the, into the ground, uh, it, it exists, but that process takes a long time if you want, and it takes for me, uh, thinking about it from a technical regulatory point of view, it is way too long uh, to uh, be able to enable all this scale up to happen. You know? So uh, somewhere there has to be a dialogue with the policymakers, as Bruce was saying, where we are able to go back and say, hey, these things need to change. Uh, or else we will go. Uh, we won't be able to progress on a, on a fast enough, in a fast enough fashion. And we're not talking about trying to circumvent or to uh, go past certain things or ignore certain. We're talking about just the process needs to be sped up. It's it's technically and uh, uh, from an assurance standpoint quite robust, and it can happen much faster. You know? uh, similarly, on the other side, uh, for instance, we're going to work a uh, very hard on, let's say, decarbonizing uh, 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 a cement plant or something. Well, the cement that is going to come out of that plant uh, is going to be, quote unquote, a low carbon footprint cement. You know, well, there is not a market mechanism or a regulatory mechanism today to make that cement uh, different from all the other high carbon footprint cement, if you like, you know. Now, there may be it's sort of advanced companies like Chevron or Microsoft or someone who will say that the cement I acquire will be from certain places, but you don't want to leave it to some, some kind of a goodwill from a company to be able to do something like that. There has to be uh, some, uh, some kind of a system by which this thing gets formalized to give it a lot more impetus, you know. So again, you know, you, you need to then raise it to the level that Bruce was talking about, where the policy has to be has to be able to follow some of these practices, such that it uh, takes away the roadblocks or the the difficulties of making these things commercially viable. You know, if these things are not business and commercial commercially viable, then it's just not going to scale up. If you and technology, which is what most people come to as soon as you talk about it, like direct air capture or something, that's not the issue today. Today, the issue is scale up from where we are. And for the scale up, there is low hanging fruit. If that doesn't happen, well, direct air capture is never going to happen. You know? so, so let's do the stuff that we can today with our means today and take the roadblocks out of the way for that such that carbon capture and sequestration becomes a viable business for the future. I think that's that for me, I think that if I can pass that message saying the policymakers need to be tuned in along with agents, uh, organizations such as yourself from the Pre-Court Institute or other, other parts of Stanford. And there are so many people uh, who are lending to the thought leadership in this space if you want, and you guys do an amazing job to move this thing forward. We have to pass this message through Arun or through whoever it might be, but this needs to reach the right people so that uh, we all work together to make this thing move forward. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, e, back to you. Yeah, the conversation so far has been uh, very exciting. Now let's come to the fun part of that. Um, it, uh, let's get some uh, questions from the audience. Well, let's start by having our students' uh, questions. Uh, joining us today uh, are two Stanford students, uh, Gerger Wen and uh, Kareem Ibrick. Uh, Gerger is a Stanford PhD student in energy resources engineering. Um, she is currently working with, uh, actually with Sally on the topic of uh, simulations for CO2 ge geological storage 
these machine learning approaches. Karim is a Stanford MBA student uh, and uh, with a master um, in uh, Stanford Earth. Uh, with both of them joining us, I think we're presenting pretty the broad background. Uh, let me bring uh, Gurgur and Karim to the stage. Uh, which one do you want to go first? Um, thank you. I think I will go first. Sounds good. And thank you again to Bruce and Ashok for joining us today. Um, so for the first question, for both Bruce and Ashok, uh, in your opinion, what's the biggest technological challenge that you expect given the Mendota project will be a first of its kind operation? Well, technically, I think we, we haven't spoken too much about this here, but the gasifier that takes in this waste biomass from the farms, uh, the input waste biomass uh, has to be at the, the right configuration to be able to go into this gas and how this gasifier manages to uh, yield the gas that goes into the turbine. Uh, is uh, an important challenge. And uh, these turbines have not been used in the past to do this kind of work, which captures 100% of the carbon dioxide. So to actually make it work at scale for 300 kilotons uh, is also a technical challenge. You know? Now, from there on, the carbon capture and uh, the, the sequestration itself um, is, I would say, less challenging. Uh, although uh, after we've sequestered for some period of time to make sure that the sequestration is progressing correctly. Um, so maybe using some of the work you're doing in carbon capture and sequestration, uh, surveillance and assurance uh, with simulation in the future using machine learning maybe, uh, those will be interesting things to come in the future. But in the immediate execution, I think there are execution or project management issues but besides that, technically, these two, the gasification and the, the electrification from the gas uh, are technical challenges that we have to contend with. There's a lot of people working on it, so I don't think it's insur insurmountable. And from a fundamental standpoint, it works, but we still have to engineer it to, to execute what we have planned. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the answer. And Bruce? Well, I don't know that I have anything really to add. I think Ashok put his finger on the, you know, the two particular technical challenges, which makes this the first of. I mean, you pointed out that we've operated or are operating a carbon capture project. It's a four million ton per day carbon capture project in Australia. And so, you know, the parts of it that are common to Mendota doesn't feel like serial number one for us. And he put his finger on the two technology issues that I think you know, are, are at the core of what we've got to prove out in this project. Thank you, Bruce and uh, Shock. I, uh, my question is around the Valley of Death, uh, commercializing the first of a kind. Um, one can say that corporations have more patient capital than venture capital or private equity. I want to ask you to what extent do you think that is true? And if so, I'd appreciate if you can elaborate on to what extent are you willing to take a higher risk on early commercialization to achieve a longer term strategic position or sustainable returns? Well, I think, um, you know, different forms of capital allocation in the economy have, have different roles. Um, you know, you see a progress being made through a variety of different, you know, scale companies with different kinds of capabilities. A lot of innovation comes um, from small companies um, and, you know, from firms that are backed uh, through venture capital um, investments. We have a venture capital arm as part of our company we've had for uh, about 20 years um, investing in startups and, um, you know, kind of early concepts. Um, at the same time, uh, Chevron um, and Schlumberger, I think for that matter, long dated companies, we, we have a history of 140 years and um, we have, because of our long uh, standing success, the ability uh, to be patient and work things that are long dated. Um, that carbon capture project that we referred to a couple of times in Australia is associated with our Gorgon project. And that was about three decades from the original discovery of the resource until everything aligned, policy, uh, commercial terms, customers, uh, partners that were going to do it. And a company like Chevron has the staying power to stay with a good idea and, and see it through. And so I think that's, that's important. We, in our internal capital allocation, we segregate things a little bit. So um, uh, 
opportunities that might, you know, have great promise, but lower um, near-term financial results, we, we look at in one way. Others that are part of our mainline business, we, we look at in another. Um, but we ultimately think uh, for our business that we have to simultaneously meet the needs of our investors, uh, which is higher returns, and the needs of society, which is lower carbon. And those are, you know, one or the other. There are things we have to do at the same time. And so our approach of how we think about capital and, and our ability uh, to uh, stay with things in a little longer term, I, I think is constructive in that. Uh, but there are roles for others to play. And even in Mendota, you have companies of varying scale and a varying structure that are coming together to partner. And I think it's a complementary capabilities that we bring that's gonna make this project successful. So I think what Bruce said in the end is very important is that uh, I think the way the, the four companies came together, they cover enough characteristic that in terms of tax equity or in terms of LCFS, and there is enough uh, knowledge and capability that we would be able to uh, handle most of the situations, I think. But moving, moving the question from simply Mendota to carbon capture and sequestration, and there are, in, in the United States alone today, there are probably, I don't know, like a hundred projects which are being worked on. And we are involved in quite a few of those with different sectors of industry. And uh, it's not limited only to corporate capital. There is plenty of private equity capital, which is uh, being considered for uh, investment into these projects. You know? So uh, places like uh, in the Midwest, where there is uh, biofuels with uh, carbon capture possible, um, where, where the, um, the emission streams are quite concentrated, uh, it's going to happen with private capital, actually. You know, there are places in Louisiana where there are hubs that will be created. They may happen with corporate capital, with the big oil companies, but they could happen also with private capital. You know. So uh, is one or the other more suitable? Well, I think in, in innovative configurations like Mendota, you need different types of uh, thinking process, the tax equity and the the LCFS monetization and so on. For that, you need expertise, if you like. So uh, companies like this can maybe do it better. Sometimes private equity is quite uh, tuned to doing these kind of things, you know. So um, I, I I hope and uh, that a lot of capital gets leveraged into the carbon capture and sequestration process, private and from corporations. So. Okay, we're going to move now to the first um, audience question. Um, and so the question is, and, and it's, it's for both of you really, um, can you talk about how digital technology helped you scale from the idea phase to eventual commercialization? Um, and, and maybe I'll, I'll sort of shift the, the question a little bit, because I think one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is that the uh, oil and gas industry was actually a huge consumer of digital technology, uh, and, and continues to innovate in that area. Um, you know, thinking like as a reservoir simulator creates a digital twin of, you know, the subsurface. So anyway, so yeah, so over to you. What, what is the role of digital technology and innovation in this space for you? I, I'm going to say one thing here, which uh, uh, is an interesting little twist uh, in which uh, there is something to do with digital that is meaningful for Mendota. Interestingly, Chevron, Chevron, uh, Schlumberger and Microsoft actually are today working on and started working on a digital collaboration for the oil and gas business about three years ago or 2019, I think. You know. uh, we announced it in 2019, but we started working on it uh, a lot earlier. So um, the partners are, have already understood how to work on something which is quite groundbreaking in the oil and gas business as well, where Chevron's moving all its data to cloud and Shlomoji doing the same and moving all our applications that we work on together to cloud and leverage it for more efficient workflows and processes in the oil and gas business. Um, the same three constituencies actually came together because we are partners to do something quite daring and uh, different in the carbon 
capture and sequestration process. So it's not like Mendota is going digital uh, overnight, but the fact is that that digital collaboration helped this collaboration uh, to, to proceed further. Now, I think the, the, uh, in the world of new energy, actually, uh, and I'll spread this question to new energy, it's a very interesting place for digital because the legacy is very, very small, if you want. So for all our hydrogen work that we are doing on solid oxide electrolysis or some of the work we will do in, in uh, Mendota and other projects like Bex projects, if I may say, uh, they are going to use digital configurations which are very modern and uh, they will be built on Azure right from the beginning, maybe. Uh, and so the, they will be future compatible, if you want, right from the beginning. So native digital, if, you might, if I may say like that, you know, we're working on a building heating and cooling system where the, we start off by a digital system working on cloud. Uh, so the opportunity that uh, we do even project management in a digital way, the project, the execution files pass to operation files in a seamless manner because it is built on cloud and with collaboration happening on cloud, the fact that we can innovate on an ongoing basis, uh, all this will be natural components of uh, working in a digital way in the future in new energy because the legacy doesn't exist that you have to transform if you want. And wherever we are putting something in place, we are going to make sure that it is uh, cloud compatible and uses all the platform attributes that one uses in digital today. Okay, Bruce, would you like to add anything? Well, I, I agree with Ashok that I think the role of digital is going to be very important in new energies. You know, there are some things that are different, like you take the, the electric grid, you had kind of constant supply as the main, you know, what it was mainly um, built around and variable demand, and you optimize things a certain way. Now, with renewables occupying a bigger part of it, you have variable supply and variable demand, and that's that's a different kind of uh, uh, challenge. And so we, we, as an industry, have used digital, digital tools for a long time. Some of my early days were um, running reservoir simulations, and I think our industry were some of the early users or instigators of the development of supercomputers um, and we've you know generally found ourselves at the edge of what is what is possible and the challenges as i see them that we're facing in the energy transition you know suggest to me we're going to be using digital in all forms the things that we do around hydrogen around smart grids around carbon capture and some of those just like we have in our traditional business they'll have digital twins associated with them so we can figure out ways to optimize. And you know, to the point Ashok made, I remember my very earliest days plotting production from wells by hand with a pencil and a piece of graph paper. You know, and we had lots of that. That we we weren't a digital native of, in that industry. That you know, we were digital immigrants. The uh, digital came, and we had to move it into the things and work processes that we were doing. Um, with the energy transition, we have the opportunity to build it from the get-go uh, in a digitally smart fashion, and that opens up a lot of opportunities and will, I think, be responsible in part for the progress we make in costs and the ability with the right kind of alignment to um, really find opportunities to commercialize things. Okay, terrific. Okay, well, go, go back to you. Thank you. So for the next question, I want to dive deeper on the Mandota project. So the goal is to remove 300,000 tons or 0.3 million tons of CO2 per year. So I'm curious at what are the factors and the reasoning of choosing this target? Let's start with Bruce. Well, you know, so uh, the, uh, you know, project design is a function of many trade-offs. Um, at the end of the day, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, what equipment uh, do you have available to select from? What's going to be cost effective? What feedstock do you have, and how certain um, and do you have around the, you know around that? The the scale of the project, you know, you have to have something to get your mind wrapped around. Um, in many ways, to me, accomplishing this and being able to stand back once it's in operation and and point at it and say that is a commercial project, to me, you know, the gateway value of this is uh, very important. You know, it has to check all of the boxes. It has to 
deliver power. It needs to be carbon negative. It needs to be commercial. You know, we need to effectively, you know, uh, meet those technical challenges that um, Ashok uh, described. But you know, we've learned in our in our mainline business, if you can design once and build many times, that's a good pathway to scale. Um, and so the size of this, you know, it's got to be something that you feel like you can you can execute around. And so you could be bigger or smaller, but it seemed, you know, reasonable confluence there. I, I don't know. I, let me ask Ashok to to weigh in as well, because I think he's probably got some thoughts in, in this space. Oh, well, I mean, I think the, the, we, we had when we started working on this, we had uh, uh, five different plants that exist already. We, because one of the interesting thing here is that these plants exist already and we're going to reshape them into bioenergy with CCS. So they used to be bioenergy plants, if you like, in the past, right? So we had the choice of a few. And uh, um, as Bruce said, we looked at uh, who, which ones were the most valid for the quickest, most viable project, if you like. And this one, which is used to be a 20 megawatt plant, uh, if you back calculate from that, uh, how much we could use, uh, we, how much input biomass we could use, and hence how much carbon dioxide would come with the air separation. This this was the configuration in this plant, which works the best. You know, so it might change by a little bit uh, in the end, um, but uh, it's a function of selecting that plant. And once we selected that plant, then these numbers were in place. You know, but eventually there's a roadmap of doing many others like this in California, and that will go to much higher numbers, hopefully. You know? So this is just, as we have said, a starting uh, project. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, now to Karim. Thanks. I wanted to talk to you about uh, carbon prices. Uh, carbon prices have been picking up with uh, low carbon fuel standards sitting at around $200 a ton and the EU emission trade scheme almost tripling in the past year to around $70 a ton and many others that are coming online. My question is, how do you navigate the immense and growing transition in, this, in the policy space? And maybe more specifically, how do you deal with carbon pricing, risk and volatility in your investment decisions, either in new energy or in the fossil space? Maybe we can start with Ashok. Uh, well, I think uh, Bruce is more of an expert on, uh, because uh, working as an oil company, an oil company always navigates these kinds of issues. Um, and certainly the knowledge of LCFS and Chevron is much better than what we have in Schlumberger. And that's why we have the complementarity. Um, but in general, I think the, the idea is that we've taken what is uh, our reasonable numbers uh, from the past history and what is possible with the current regulation. And uh, we are going to design the project and engineer it to be viable with the, the current known numbers in the, in the market. Now, the important point that we made in the beginning is that we are going to the lowest hanging fruit. So we are taking a place where current regulations apply and make it commercially viable and economically feasible with the technologies that we have. Now, I think the question you're asking is valid for uh, when we this is going to scale to tens and then hundreds of megatons, you know, then how will people navigate those those uncertainties of uh, of uh, let's say market mechanisms or regulatory mechanisms? You know, LCFS being let's say a market mechanism and 45Q being a regulatory mechanism. You know? So here here is where then what we said earlier, policy has to follow. You know, policy has to be tuned in and policy has to follow. Otherwise, these risks are going, not going to work. Or maybe the banks have to come up, the financial system has to come up with the right solutions, or the insurance systems have to come up with the right solutions, right? And these are not something that uh, I govern and I have knowledge of, or Chevron does. I think the system needs to progress in this direction. Yeah, I might, uh, I might add, uh, you know, the carbon price or you know the future volatility um, is uh, another uncertainty that we that we have to deal with um, you know in our business for a long time we have a lot of investments in the oil and gas sector and um, those are commodities uh, commodities have volatility and uncertainties and we have um, reasonably sophisticated 
um, internal processes and models that we use to do that. Look, we look at um, supply, demand, uh, consumer preferences, um, you know, what was happening in the world economies. Um, and um, we uh, forecast, um, you know, those markets. And I've done so for a long time, the markets for um, gasoline and diesel and jet. Um, and, you know, as a part of that now, and we've done this for some time, uh, you know, carbon, carbon prices, uh, those, those forecasts, which are done geography by geography, because a difference in uh, carbon prices, say relative to oil prices, oil is a global market that sets on a kind of common basis across the globe, adjusted a bit for quality and some location differences, but carbon prices are not the prices in Europe are different and are driven differently than they are say in the US and presumably differently as other jurisdictions adopt them as well. And so there's an additional complicating factor, but those prices as we forecast them then work their way into every evaluation, every project evaluation that we do, um, our financial analysis, our consideration of financial impairments, um, it becomes um, you know the central or integrated into every aspect where you might otherwise have any financial consideration because that's what it turns out to be um, looking on a project basis. Uh, but we also recognize we have to have a, a you know, fair amount of humility. Predicting the future is hard. And um, while we have a view that we think is most likely, we test our views against alternative scenarios and are looking for project decisions in all aspects of our business to be robust across those scenarios. And we'll do the same thing here um, with Mendota. Um, but, you know, for other projects as well, um, you know, that will be important and it's, um, we're not, you know, necessarily unique in contemplating that. And, you know, the point that Ashok made earlier, um, capital will be allocated to support the growth in this that we need when markets can reliably count on certain things occurring. And, you know, carbon price that grows out of a certain kind of policy is important to that. Um, and, you know, if it can be done at the highest level of the economy, um, if it can be done in a fair and balanced manner, it can be done transparently. We think those are attributes um, that work really effectively. And you know, as as uh, um, entities in the economy can begin to plan and anticipate those, they'll act on that basis. And you know, a lot of uh, momentum will be built as a result of it. Yeah, Bruce and Asha, the, the, this this conversation is great. Um, uh, indeed, in the audience, there are a couple questions asking about how economically business-wise for uh, CO2 capture storage uh, sequestration, how does that work? I think Kareem's question, uh, he asked you expand that broadly, also answer the audience questions, I will now repeat. Now let me uh, get to uh, a, a, a different question from the audience. Uh, can you be more specific about you know the technology already working so well today for carbon capture storage in this category and what's in the pipeline uh, we have earlier earlier we have discussion on this already i think the discussion probably spread and uh, it, it's a good chance to uh, you know to be concise and, and, and tell the audience uh, what's available today what's coming next who wants to take this bruce or uh, ashok you know, the, the things that probably work the best today, you know, are less in my mind a function about the technology than they are about the stream from which you're attempting to capture things. So streams that are very concentrated typically, I think are in a better position today. Um, the technology seem to revolve around what do you use to take a somewhat dilute stream and concentrate the CO2 to a point that you can do something with. And there are different chemistry and different physical uh, principles that are being pursued in that regard and and what i see and you know and we, we're invested in a company called savante um, which is making a device that you can put on a boiler or something with a somewhat dilute stream and uh, you can concentrate that and you know they've gone through uh, an evolution of the kind of material they're using to make that happen and that's you know typical and you know the sort it it parallels a bit what we've seen happen in wind and solar with more efficient turbines, uh, you know, more aerodynamically efficient blades on windmills, uh, more effective um, solar cells that can turn solar energy into electricity, that same sort of thing. But right now, um, you know, it's uh, largely determined by the stream that you have to work mm -hmm. with. We want to move to, you know, increasingly more challenging streams, eventually 
getting to uh, direct air capture. Uh, and it's that technology, how do you take something dilute and efficiently from an energy standpoint, concentrate it, I think is at the core of, of what we're really chasing. So Ashok, I'll you know, turn it to you. Yeah, I, I think if I if I were to kind of generally make a statement without going in, I mean, this is a broad subject, so it's hard to sort of just uh, narrow it down uh, broadly. Uh, as we said, there are uh, different streams uh, and uh, uh, in all those streams, there is work going on and technology companies that are working on innovating various aspects of it, you know. So today we are aware of what's happening in the biofuel industry and there there is a lot of possibilities. I think tens of megatons to be captured and sequestered with known technologies, if you want. There is the blue hydrogen industry, which is going to, uh, to uh, start, where in an SMR process, which is producing hydrogen from gas, uh, you are able to capture a very large portion of the carbon dioxide, and you'll be able to sequester to make the hydrogen clean. Uh, in a cementing process, you are not able to capture a, a very large amount, but you are able to ca capture enough to be able to sequester to almost half the, the carbon footprint of the cement. And similarly, there are numbers in steel and so on. So in all of these sectors, which are uh, large CO2 emission sectors, there is work going on to be able to capture and sequester the carbon dioxide. And there's plenty of runway right now to start uh, these projects and these businesses. And as we work on these projects that can start already, there are very innovative companies which are working, of course, on direct air capture, which is much further down the road, but on dilute streams through, uh, again, the physics of either the pressure swing or the electrochemical swing or the chemical swing of adsorption desorption. All the physics exists, but from the physics to actually engineer a solution that you can apply to an existing stream, it takes a little bit of work. And there are engineering companies that are working on dilute stream uh, carbon capture, which will be in, numbers that are good enough to be able to uh, make a project uh, economically viable. You know? So uh, if I may leave a, a message, there is plenty of roadmap which is viable today. You know? So uh, we need to just uh, embark on the business on the heavy streams where it is obviously viable and then keep on growing the dil more dilute streams as technology and innovation develops. And there's lots of room for uh, small innovative companies that would come up and do this innovation and then companies such as ourselves and Chevron will scale these technologies to make these projects viable. Okay, um, so we've talked a lot about uh, pumping CO2 back underground um, and the question from the audience is, well, what about CO2 utilization? Can we, you know, make products with it? Um, yeah, love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, in the interest of conciseness, the short answer is yes. We can. Um, you know, uh, we are, I mentioned earlier, we're invested in a company that um, will take uh, carbon CO2 and use it as the feed for um, synthetic aggregate. And so everywhere, you know, we're in, I'm in California here. So I-5, I-10, every freeway in, in um, the LA basin, um, you know, all the way across the country, that all is potentially um you know, a carbon sequestration location as well as uh, new buildings. And, and so uh, there are um, utilization uh, opportunities. Uh, we're probably gonna have to avail ourselves of both. Uh, once we've captured the carbon, some of it is gonna make sense to sequester. And I, I agree with Ashok, let's start where we can and make progress. And um, you know, the, the, the progress here, I think will open other pathways to us. And at the same time, um, identifying places where we can utilize it um, to some other uh, better benefit will will be important. But yes, those those opportunities exist, and uh, we can and should pursue those. I, I think Bruce said it all, but in a very concise message, uh, I think to, if the world is going to decarbonize by using carbon carbon management in terms of carbon capture and sequestration or carbon usage, then the most urgent thing to do is to get the business of carbon capture and sequestration going. That is today the most urgent question. 
Hi, uh, Bruce and Ashok. Thank you so much for the great conversation. Uh, I'd like to thank all the audience around the world, also thanking our student particip uh, participants. Um, we started the Global Energy Dialogue last June, soon after the COVID lockdown. Um, this has been a great event at Stanford. We hope this has been serving the purpose for the whole world, bring the energy experts together to uh, really discuss about how do we decarbonize. You know, we started with the conversation with uh, Secretary Ernie Moniz, Steve Chu, and then with uh, Chad Holiday. Uh, so many great events, Bill Gates come. And, uh, and last month we have our own uh, Political Advisory Council member, Mike Morgan and Doc Kimmerman, and Bruce and uh, Ashok. And thank you so much for uh, sharing with us your perspective. Uh, with this uh, global energy dialogue now lasting for a year, uh, many of us all, all get vaccinated. We decided and say next several months is our summer time. We will take a break. So uh, we'll go to the beach and thinking hard about uh, how do we do energy for the next step. We'll resume you know, after the Stanford start a new quarter in the, uh, in the fall. Thank you so much. Bye now. <laughs>